Today we're back talking to Ernie Emerson. And we're gonna talk about all the little innovations that all came together to create the big game changer for Emerson Knives. for the wave. I mean, that, that really seems to have been the game changer. Could... Well, it, it, it definitely changed it for me, let's say that. Uh, you want to hear the story about the, I do, the wave? Yeah, I love stories. Okay, so, and this will actually tie up the first story that I was telling. So anyway, what is the wave? Well, the wave is this, this little feature on the, on the top uh, part of the knife, and it looks kind of like a wave, which is why that's why I called it. But what happens is it, it hooks and can pull the blade out and open it. So when you, the, the knife that I have in my pocket doesn't have a wave on it right now, which we'll talk about that later. That's my folding steak knife that I, that I carry because I cut a lot more steaks than I, <laughs> than I do anything else these days. But anyway, when you pull the knife out, and I'll pull it out slowly, it hooks on that corner and deploys and it. deploys yeah and I watched it on the YouTube video and I couldn't quite catch it so this is a huge help yeah so when it catches boom on that well look at my my pants are all worn out from when I have the wave but that that opens up the knife what model is that this is a CQC 13 uh, it, it's my buoy my folding buoy knife I'm a big fan of buoys because again Americana. History, yeah. The first thing I started studying was the Alamo. That's and, our knife, and, man. And, you know, the, 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 the Bowie brothers, you know. Oh, that's a huge, yeah, cool you know, story and, about and all sto of that. And the, the, the myth or the legend of, of, of resin finding a piece of asteroid, <laughs> throwing it into the cauldron, <laughs> get a little piece of heaven, a little piece of hell. <laughs> I love it. It is a great story, and it is an Americana it's a story of our culture. It's a story of our history. Uh, I mean, who didn't watch? Um, God, now I'm thinking back to Walt Disney with uh, Fess Parker, Fess Parker and, and and Buddy Epson. Yeah, and a little song that goes something like this. <laughs> yeah, um, God, what was it? I keep thinking of that. There once was a story about a man named Jed, but that's the Beverly Hills. <laughs> Davy, Davy Crockett, and, and, and they and, and they sold so many coonskin caps. Oh, I mean, I've got you, one. You and I are the same <laughs> generation. It's like I love that. One stuff. kid on the block has one. Pretty soon, there's twelve. Oh over. God, that's so funny. And every time we watch the Christmas story, the kid with the coonskin caps in there, it's like <laughs> different story. But I was back in Cleveland for Thanksgiving, and they actually have. The Christmas Story House is a museum. Oh, do they really? Yeah, no, it's That's it's cool. it's all. I'll, I'll send you some pictures what a great later. Movie. But driving down the street and I'm through this nasty <laughs> this little looks, neighborhood. This looks familiar. Yeah, and 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 we, I'm parked. It's like, dude, I'm not armed. I mean, where am I? And yeah. my buddy knocks and he points back over here and he goes, "I see a leg lamp in the window." Yeah, and it's like I, the some, leg lamp. Suddenly, yeah. I know where I'm at. But anyway. <laughs> Once again, That's funny. I digress. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's fun stuff. And I'll tell you, I love buoys. I mean, mm -hmm. I've, I've always loved that style of knife and that design. So I've actually got a few in our, in our, uh, I don't know, catalog, if you will. It's not in the catalog, but in my, my mind's catalog. I've got uh, buoy designs in that that we've done uh, over time because I still fall, fall back to it. It's just such a cool, cool knife. But back to the wave. So because I was... Um, had gone to that knife show, ran into knife making, you know, decided that I wanted to do it, uh, I started uh, uh, making knives in my garage. And so this was before the, I mean, there was the very first start startup of the internet and all that. It was still, uh, I can't remember, Commodore 64 computers and stuff. So it wasn't like you could just click online and go to someone's website and view their product. So how do, how do I get my knife in, in front of people, you have to go to knife shows, go to gun shows, go to knife shows, have a table, have your wear set up. And I'd been making knives for a while, uh, probably about two or three years as a hobby. And I was at a knife show in Southern California, and uh, three guys walked up to my table and introduced themselves as underwater welders. And I was like, wow, that's an interesting 
job. That's cool. <laughs> and uh, no, I've been from northern Wisconsin. It's like, what the hell is an underwater welding? What do you do? What are you welding in the water? You know, it's like the oil rigs and all that kind of ships, the big docks and all that stuff are here. So I was like, okay, got it. Uh, we need a knife that we can do this or do that. And I said, uh, wow, that's interesting. I, I, they, they asked me if I'd be interested in working with them, building the knife uh, design based on their input and stuff like that. And I said, yeah, why not? Absolutely. Um, so I made uh, a couple of knives, struck up a relationship with them. Uh, they, because they were at, in, here in Southern California, more or less, they had the ability to show up. I gave them my home address. They would come over to my house. Uh, we'd sit around in the garage and draw things on paper and try this and that. Finally came up with a knife that uh, was the, a, I used to tell the story that it was the sixth iteration of the knife that we had d designed in order to get to that one that they said, this is, this is the one we want like this. But what I found out was uh, after about a year, uh, they said, you know, Ernie, we haven't been 100% forthright with you about who we are. And I said, okay, so? And they said, well, we're, we're not underwater welders, we're Navy SEALs. And at that time, uh, the Navy SEALs was something that, uh, uh, I don't even think the movie with Martin Sheen or whatever, Charlie Sheen or whatever had even come it out. It was yet. talked about in hushed rooms. It and was. Nobody, knew. nobody really knew about it, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, and not only that, but we're with a very specialized uh, segment of the SEAL community. And you can read between the lines, but that's why it was called the CQC 6. Yeah, yeah. You can, it, it doesn't take a whole lot of fancy <laughs> math to figure this out. <sighs> so, anyway, I started making knives for a bunch of guys. And uh, that led to another knife that we were working on. And one of the guys said, we need to have something that stops, a, that would potentially stop another a knife from um, coming down. If you were ever in a hand-to-hand a, a -hand confrontation with a weapon, that you could, I'm not going to put the point, the edge against it, but to illustrate the concept, a knife that would slide down and, and catch before it would slide up and catch hit the person's hand who was holding it. And so they said, can you put a little hook on the top? And I said, yeah, 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 that'd be cool. I, I got it. It's like a guard, but it's, you know, um, and I made a little curve on it. Uh, they left. Uh, I started uh, hacksawing something out with my, my little hacksaw and a file and everything on, on a piece of steel and uh, was like, okay, this, this could work. This could work. So a couple days later, I, I called them up and said, come on back. I think I've got a working model and all that. I came back up. They said, oh, um, I don't have a commander sitting here right now. I'll get a commander and show you the actual knife. But let's say this was the knife. Uh, they said, that'll work. We've got a little projection on there. And I said, well, let's call it a wave because, you know, we're in Southern California. It's Ocean City, you know, that kind of stuff. So I said, take it, take it back play with it, you know, see if it has, because it had a distinctive blade shape and everything. Uh, we called it the Commander, and uh, let me know if you like it. So it takes them about 90 minutes or so to get from here down to Coronado, and uh, I'm, I'm in my garage, and I've, I kept one of the models myself, and I put it in my pocket, and I pulled it out, and as I pulled it out, it kind of pulled the knife open like that, and I thought, oh, wow, that hook caught on something. Pulled it out again, caught again, pulled it out the third time, boom, a little more force, open the knife up. And I'm like, hot damn. I can pull that knife out of my pocket and, and it's open. In a, in a fighting situation or a self-defense situation, uh, you know, it's like a fixed blade. I pull it out it, of the sheath. It just sheet, became a fixed it's blade open. and you're not interrupting yeah. with another hand. Absolutely. And I, and I don't mean it's just, no, believe me, let me just state this for the record. I don't care who you are, what you are, what you use, no fixed blade. No folding knife is ever as strong as a fixed blade. With a full tang, yeah. There is moving parts, so that's a fact. So don't let anybody ever fool you. Tell you that one's as good as the other. When yeah. people say, I have a locking knife, it's not a lock. A lock means it can't undo. If I can undo it, it's not locked open. So again, I always tell people, look, it's, it's a... Um, 
it's called a lock, but it's more of a safety catch, if you will. And, and hopefully the, the knives that people are making are, are built well enough and engineered uh, well enough so that, that that safety catch mechanism keeps the blade from accidentally closing. Yeah. yeah, but you can never trust a, a fixed blade, a, excuse me, a folding knife like you can same trust Same way you never blade. trust a safety on a pistol. Absolutely, 100% same, same story, exactly. So anyway, I'm pulling this knife out and it's starting to open up. My phone rings in the garage. And it's the guys down in, now they've made it back to Coronado, and they said, I won't swear, but they said, God, Ernie, do you know what this knife does when you, when you pull it out of your pocket? It blink and opens, it opens the blade up. And I go, man, I just, just found that out myself. It was always one of those weird coincidences in life. I, I, I was like, I just found that out. And they're going, yeah. And then the next part of the sentence was, it opens beer bottles. <laughs> And God looked down yes. and smiled. Yeah, and that was, that was such a cool thing. But anyway, that's the story of the wave. I would like to tell you that I was a genius and I came up with it. I really didn't. So much of things are happy accidents. I executed it, and it ended up being what it is. And, and that was something that uh, we, 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 get, we got a patent on it, and it was unique to our knives for a long, long time and uh, was something that became a requirement. Every, every military unit or... Uh, contract that we had have gotten period since that time has required that the wave be a, an integral feature of, of the night. There's no going backwards. No. You know, once you let the cat out of the bag, yeah. good luck with that. And and also, you know, you can, uh, if you're if you're in a, a situation where you have to open the knife, you can pull it against your gear, anything. you can drag it on anything to also open it up. And so that that became the the, one of the defining uh, features of what Emerson knives are. The other thing that uh, that knife had was a chisel grind and a Tonto, Tonto-esque point, let's just say that. America, uh, American version of a Tonto. Yeah, well, point. like you'd find on a samurai sword. Yeah, although I have to say in deference to the, uh, to the samurai swords, theirs are a lot more refined. Ours, mine was a little bit more uh, abrupt. Uh, to the point, because although there are swords that have a, a very uh, marked demarcation between that, that front edge and the, and the cutting edge, uh, generally it's a little bit more of a curve. Uh, I, I went further and made it a real sharp Very um, defined edge. angle. Yeah. And uh, let me do something. Uh, Danny, could you, could you get me a CQC-7 and a commander knife and, so we can actually see what I'm talking about in person here. Thank you. Uh, and by the way, you know we're here at my shop. This is a normal working day, so if the phone rings or if somebody slams a door or if somebody runs in and says, hey, Ernie, this machine's broken, I'm going to have to, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to get up and go to take care of it. So. Hey, we both live in the real world, you yeah. know. I mean, control is slippery stuff, so. <laughs> but this is very cool that you're able to come by, and this is how what I do every day, all day long, and uh, I have so much fun at it. But what happened was, as I, after I made that knife for those guys, um, the, the story ends up being that somehow Benchmade Knives, now, now Benchmade uh, was a company that uh, became, was the, uh, the offspring, thank you Danny, I appreciate it, was the uh, offspring of uh, Pacific, Pacific Cutlery, yeah. which moved from Los Angeles area up to Oregon, and I think it was because uh, Les wanted to be able to make switchblades and things like that. And Oregon, of course, had a uh, uh, open open policy on, on those types of, of More knives. permissive environment, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, they heard about what I was doing with the SEAL teams, and lo and behold, called me up and said, "Ernie, we'd like you to design a knife for us." So I said, "Oh, wow, that's super cool." I mean, here I'm just a kid in his garage, you know. Uh, making stuff for fun and having be, uh, everything that I built and sold meant that I could get a new drill press or I could get an actual <laughs> bandsaw. And so that's where I was at. So here I am with a knife company calling me up saying we'd like to make one of your, your knives. And I said, oh, that'd be awesome. And at the time I didn't realize it that Benchmade was the, the child of Pacific Cutlery. So I go up there, full circle, design a knife 
and it was the CQC7. And that's what I'm talking about as an Americanized Tonto, or my version of a Tonto, if you will. And that became, without a doubt, the number one selling tactical knife that, that has ever existed. Uh, maybe the Buck 110 can challenge that, but it wasn't designed as a tactical knife. It, it, was, it was a hunting, it was knife, a hunting yeah. knife. And uh, I was like, I told him the story. I said, the only reason I make knives is because I couldn't afford to buy one of your knives when I started knife making. So here I am in their corporate offices designing with their engineers, and I'm like, this is the reason, you guys are the reason that I even do this, and now you're, yeah, you're going to do one of my designs. The validation like, must have been overwhelming. Oh, it was, it was a very cool time. Let's just say that. Very, very cool time. But uh, think of the irony in that, though. I mean, yeah, yeah. Now, the other cool thing about that knife that I designed for the, for the uh, teams was if you look at the back of this, there's no edge on the back. There, I mean, no bevel. And so this knife is ground on one side only, vis-a-vis -vis a chisel. Now, there is a secondary edge on there because we had to be able to make people have the ability to sharpen the knife because uh, not everybody... I try sharpening a chisel sometimes. Believe me, I, I use them all the time. There's an art to learning how to sharpen a chisel because it's a feathered point at that end. Most people can't do that, and, and I'll tell you honestly, uh, you put somebody out in the field, they don't have a whetstone. No, they or have know a, how to use They it. have a rock or a piece of pipe or, or a piece, piece of, of glass. Who knows? What they're they lucky have. if they have a slab of concrete. Yeah. yeah, and that, believe me, I've done that. Uh, so this allows people to, it's, it's strong because it has a really great cross-sectional uh, mass, but it also allows you to just work on, basically on sharpening, uh, you know, one side. If, if this was a, a stone and I was sharpening, I could do this and get that back to a serviceable edge in the field. And that was what we were after. You know, you can, you can do everything you want when you're, after you've uh, come back from a, a deployment or whatever, or a mission or, or an assignment, uh, when you're sitting in the uh, Quonset hut and all that, and you've got but all But if you're gear. in the field. Yeah. And so, you know, that was part of the reason that we went with the chisel grind. Now, there's a little backstory to that, too. There was a very famous knife maker also um, who made uh, chisel grind um, fixed blades. Hey, Danny, who was the knife maker that made the chisel grind uh, knives? He's real famous. He was Hartsfield. Phil Hartsfield. Uh, too many blows to the head here uh, over the years. <laughs> Memory. <laughs> Believe me, that's, that's no joke. Uh, Phil Hartsfield was a very famous knife maker, and he made an incredible knife. Uh, a lot of the guys that I was working with had Phil Hartsfield knives, but they were a fixed blade, a big fixed blade. And as, as you know, uh, the World War II... Uh, soldier or Korean War soldier or even Vietnam era, era soldier, uh, those were environments where you you were geared up with your uniform and, and uh, all your gear, your, your harness, all that stuff, and you could hook your K bar, you could you know put it wherever it was that it fit your requirements. When when it became um, basically a difference in the environment of warfare. Although World War II it was fought a lot in, uh, in a city environment, uh, a lot of what happened as a result of Gulf I and Gulf II and, and uh, Afghanistan and all that was we were fighting in an urban environment. And a lot of times, and plus the guys that I was working with, a lot of time were, were, they were not geared up. They were in civilian clothes. Yeah, it was many, many warfare, so it's a different yeah. environment. Yeah. So they needed, they couldn't carry a, a K-bar. You know, and believe me, if, give me a choice to, to uh, carry a K-bar, I'll grab a K-bar. They would have if they could have, <laughs> but then they would have been telegraphing. Yeah. So, again, you know, because of what uh, the nature of the work was that they were involved in, et cetera, et cetera, they needed folding knives um, that they could uh, carry in an unobtrusive manner. And so, again, we wanted to give them, or they wanted me to give them the things that they had in these folding knives in a, or excuse me, in a fix, in these fixed blade knives in the vehicle uh, of a folding knife. So I, I did what I could to try and execute that to the best of my abilities, and uh, it worked pretty good. I'm not 
I'm not ever going to tell you I'm the best knife maker or that it's the best knife in the world. Uh, it suited the purpose, uh, and and we we've, we've been hit the ground running, and we've never slowed up since that time. So yeah, and another life saving feature is if it'll open beers, nobody's ever going to dehydrate either. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that's an integral part of uh, being in the military most of the time. <laughs> For all you pros out there, you know the importance of staying hydrated. Uh, some of the great features allow, you know, the Emerson to be sharpened up in the field because it's got a single edge. More importantly, you can also use the wave to uh, self-deploy the knife on the draw. And, and who'd have thunk that just, you know, a chance meeting with some underwater welders could end up where you're making knives for some of the top operators in the Special Forces community. So when we come back next time, we're gonna be talking about all the different variations and design decisions that go into what Ernie has put together for everyday carry knives. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our subscribers for tuning in. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe, also like and share. On behalf of Shooter the Series, I'm Ed Thorell from Firearms Education and Training. Y'all take care.